Welcome, everyone, back to Collider Mailbag. This is the weekend show where we answer your viewer submitted, submitted questions. You send them in to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We answer them here on this weekend show or on our daily movie talk show. We got a good one for you guys today. Joining me on the panel, we have Sinead DeFries. Hey, guys. Uh, happy to be here. I know I'm wearing the same clothes that I was wearing yesterday. I apologize. I know that some people get really upset to see me in the same <laughs> outfit, and I'm really sorry about that. But yes, I'm still wearing my short alls. Short alls. And we're also joined by Perry Nemiroff. Hey, guys. I'm allowed to wear the same thing because I do the same two shows on the same day, Mailbag and Best of the Week. So it makes sense that I'm dressed the same way. Right, yes. right. Lucky you. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a July 4th weekend. I hope you guys are having a good weekend uh, and maybe get a little time outside. Uh, what do we got up first? All right. So David Perez writes, hello, Collider crew. Big fan of the show and what you guys do. Keep up the good work. My question is, do you know anything about the process directors go through to star in their own films? I've always wondered how they make it happen. It seems like something that is easier said than done. I do not think Ben Affleck wrote the town and said, screw it. It's my movie, so I'll be the star of it. Also, what are some of your favorite films where the director was the main lead? Mine would be Chef with John Favreau. Thank you from South Texas. Well, I mean, if you are someone like Ben Affleck and you're making a movie, you can say that, hey, I'm going to direct this movie, I'm going to write it, I'm going to star in it. Because they, the studio wants you to because you are Ben Affleck, the big movie star. Now, if you're Chris Nolan, the director, as big a director as he is, he's not telling WB, well, I'm going to be the star yeah. of the next film that I you know that I direct nor would he but I'm just saying the reason why they let someone like a Ben Affleck do it is because he is a star and they're you know they think that him being in it is actually a beneficial thing and maybe you know when you're talking about like indie films yeah that's more of a okay is the people who are financing are they willing to put that money behind it if you are that that person I, I personally really like Chef with John Favreau I, I thought it was a nice movie that was kind of a metaphor for his career and uh, since that movie didn't cost that much money, I, you could get away with doing that. If that was a bigger budget movie, I don't think John Favreau would be starring in it. Perry? Yeah, I mean, it's just a, a movie to movie and a talent based decision. Someone like Ben Affleck probably has the power to pull the trigger and say, I'm going to star in it also. But then, you know, it also comes down to what is best for the movie so in some situations i imagine that even if ben affleck is directing a movie maybe he'll opt out of starring down the line because it just doesn't suit the film well and in terms of just the process of actually being on set and directing yourself in your own movie i think it it totally varies i've never been on a set visit where the director is directing him or herself in a movie but just having been in film school where a lot of my friends like to act in their own stuff we were actually always advised against it just because probably it was a learning environment yeah. you got to focus on one thing before you know it well enough to move on to another but I know a lot of people who just like to do it, like to be in the thick of it, especially when they write things and they have a really good understanding of it and they know just how to work with actors really well too. So it, it could be beneficial in some scenarios. It could hurt a film. I was actually trying to think of a good example of where maybe a director directing him or herself in a movie hurt the movie, mm -hmm. but I couldn't even think of that. So. I'd like to think that most people out there are making the right decisions, but I'm a big fan of John Favreau in Chef as well. Um, I thought Joseph Gordon-Levitt did a pretty damn good job with Don John, mm -hmm. which is a challenging movie to direct. But the one that I want to shout out right now is um, Don't Think Twice, which is Mike Birbiglia's new movie, and it comes out, I think it's July 22nd. One of the best New York set films I think I've ever seen. It's with him and a whole bunch of other people, Jillian Jacobs, Keegan-Michael Key, and they all play a group of improv actors who are trying to get on an SNL-type show. And Berbiglia stars in it. He directed it, and it is so, so well done. Later this month, I highly recommend checking that out. Well, in terms of what you're talking about with the process, I, you know imagine with directing yourself you direct everyone else and then when it comes to you actually being in a scene you're going to have to get feedback from other people that you trust you know it's, it's it's a learning process i actually think it's a good process for a director to actually maybe not star in your own film but have maybe a little part in there to understand what the acting process is like and so you can 
use that experience with with other people. As someone who has produced one feature film, I could never ever in my life imagine having two big jobs like that on one movie. So yeah. kudos to everyone who can pull it off. Yeah, especially with the starring thing. I think like having a little side role or whatever I think is is okay, but being the star the main star, that's a that's a different story. For me, uh, the movie I always think of that someone directed and starred in that I love, Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven. It's just a fantastic movie. And because of who Clint Eastwood is and his past with Westerns, and he just understands the genre so well. And to be able to do that later in his career, I think it was just a, a fa one of my favorite movies of all time. All right, what's next? Brian writes, Collider Movie Talk. Currently, we see only interviews with actors, directors, and producers before their movies are released, and they sing the praises to the high heavens. But will we ever see those same people to explain the hit or miss of their movie? Let us wait a couple weeks after a movie's release, and based on box office results, discuss with the same actors, directors, and producers why their movie, like Finding Dory, was a winner and Independence Day failed. Perry, what's your take on this? Well, I love this idea. I think this should happen all the time, where a couple of weeks later, people reflect on what they what they made and how it did and how it was, was received. I don't think it's ever going to happen. One, obviously, it's bad business. I mean, in any situation at a junket, if someone says something negative, I mean, that would just blow up on the internet. And... I imagine people at that point are feeling pretty good about their movie, so obviously there's no need to say anything negative about it at that time, but later on, that would be a really interesting case study if however many months the studio deems it necessary, down the line, we all kind of regrouped and had a different discussion about how the movie did at the box office, but there's a lot of great quotes out there you could find about actors crapping all over mm -hmm. their bad past movies. My favorite one ever, go Google Mark Wahlberg talking about The Happening, because that quote is pure gold. Well, with a movie like that, that's oh, easy. Sinead, uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, I agree. This is never, ever going to happen. The point of a junket is to get people excited about a movie. So that's why we do it. That's why we do it. We do it as press. We go and interview them so we can put them up on our channels and we can create buzz for them. And they will say, of course, the greatest parts about the movie because that's the studio that they're contracted to. Um, the only time we ever see actors look back is years down the line because you never know when you might work with a studio again or a director again or what. So it is horrible business to, to, to do, to say or do anything against a movie you did, even if the entire world knows it's terrible because who knows if you'd ever get hired again. Yeah, it's, Can it's, we it's, just it's, like pause? Do, do you see... See Jeff that? Baldwin. Yeah. What, I was what pointing. Is he, what, is he what is he saying? I'm pretty sure it says this. This movie sucked. <laughs> and that might. Gee, I, what, gee, I wonder what, I what movie he's talking about. <laughs> from my interview. <laughs> oh my god. That's awkward. That's um, but yeah, the, there, it's never going to happen a few no. weeks later because not only the movie might still be in theaters, mm -hmm. it might not be in other markets like in other countries. They may be launching. So if you're talking crap about your own movie, then and then also you still got streaming, right. Blu-ray, all those things. So. The only time you can really talk crap about it is maybe years in the future. And also, like you said, if you have decided, you know, like Mark Wahlberg probably is like, <laughs> guess what? I'm probably not going to work with yes. M. Night Shyamalan ever again. Right. I don't care. I'll talk bad about it. Well, a good example, though, of someone being able to talk about it is Ryan Turek from Blumhouse came on Nightmares this mm -hmm. week, and he flat out said, we know Ouija kind of sucked. So in that case... I don't know if he said those exact words. But. I don't know if he said it flat out sucked, but he, he said that they knew that it wasn't as good as it's, people yes. wanted it to be. And in that situation, even though Ouija didn't come out so long ago, it's probably good for them to say that because Ouija 2 is coming out. So it's right. like put that down because we want you guys to know we're going to make it better. So that's probably mm -hmm. a good example of this. Yeah, I think if it is good business to say something that didn't succeed, we're going to change it up and fix it. But obviously they're going to put it in a positive light. Right. Like, we're, oh, we're going to fix something. You know, not instead of, this movie sucks. It was terrible. You know, but yeah, people got to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, what's next? Robert writes, with the release of the BVS Ultimate Cut being so well received, do you think the movie should have been split into two parts like some of the early rumors suggested? Okay, so I saw the Batman B, Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition Cut uh, last week. Saw it with John Schnapp, 
Frosty, Umberto, and everyone kind of came out of it saying, hey, you know, I mean, I think I was the least enthusiastic where I was like, oh, this is, is definitely a better film. Uh, still some problems exist. With the rest of them, they they all they thought it was like night and day. But anyways, the, I talked to Schnepp about it and it being split into two. The problem with that is if you've seen the movie, you know that all the action set pieces take at place at the very end of the movie. So if you split that movie into two, the first movie would be all set up and have nothing really for fans to see. I mean, you see the destruction of uh, of Metropolis at the beginning, but that's not really, you know, a Batman fighting Superman thing. You see, there's that one short scene with, with uh, Batman and the Batmobile hitting Superman in the car and then he takes off. That's it. Everything else, all the fighting happens at the end. So if you actually split that movie into two, it's just, you couldn't sell it that way mm -hmm. because the people going to the first one would be like, what, what am I paying to see here? I mean, I didn't see the ultimate cut yet. Ultimate edition. Ultimate edition? Ultimate cut? Whatever ultimate, it is. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. I'm very curious to see it, especially given what you guys thought of it. Especially Schnepp, because mm -hmm. he seemed yeah. pretty night, night and day, day yeah. with those two reviews. But I don't think, regardless of how good it is, I don't think it's as simple as saying, oh, that means we should have made two films. Because let's say from day one they did pursue making this two films that would have completely changed the script yeah. and the way everything was structured like for example you got a hunger games which from day one of mockingjay being adapted they knew they were going to make it into two movies so the scripts were written that way and structured that way which is very different from the source material so i imagine if down the line Warner Brothers says, oh, look at what we learned from bvs that means uh, just hypothetically that means we should make blah 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 two films then they're going to structure the scripts that way. There's no cutting BVS down the middle. No, no. Uh, Sinead, did you watch Batman v Superman? Yeah, but I haven't seen the ultimate. Um, okay. The but ultimate what do you edition. what do you think about? I mean, if, even not having seen it, you, there's nothing changed in the way of right. of what the initial big stuff that happened. So yeah. imagine if you just split it down the middle and like you had all that action at the end. And you had, that kind of the Hobbit had that problem. The the last two, you had the Desolation of Smog, which was my favorite of that series, and then the uh, Battle of the Five Armies was literally just mm -hmm. action through the whole thing. And mm -hmm. it was like, what? You should have just made that into one you could movie. You say the same about Hunger Games too. Yeah. 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 And um, I agree with you, Perry. Like, if with the idea that they wanted to already put into two movies, that would have changed the movie. But they, something like The Hobbit or Hunger Games, it, it seemed like they made one movie and then afterwards was like, do, 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 do. let's just put this side here and we'll put this side here. And it seemed like we could have just made that into one movie, which if looking back now, if you did just cut Batman v Superman in half based on the way it was released, that's exactly what it would feel like. It would feel completely underwhelming and then completely overwhelming in terms of action, in terms of excitement. Yeah. There's so, also something I don't know. to be said for a limited run time also. It's like, we may think that, oh, more time to explore more characters and more story, but then you run the risk of getting out of control, whereas if you have a shorter run time, it kind of would force a filmmaker to pick and choose the best stuff and flesh it out in the time that they have rather than wind up with some insanely bloated thing that still doesn't make any sense. Yeah. They probably should just have released the all all of it from the beginning. I think that probably would have been better well received from critics and yeah. fans alike. Yeah. And I think just studios are just scared of that three hour, you know, putting that three hour runtime. Well, out let there. this be a lesson oh, yeah. <laughs> to that, everyone they, out there that people who absolutely hated the movie can turn around and say, "Hey, that was all right." So yeah. just do it. Yeah, just I think I, th it. I think I don't know if they'll totally change their mind, but I think that will put at least some thoughts in their, yeah. their head. The runtime doesn't mean all that much. It's how long the movie feels yes. that's right. important. Right. Yeah. All right, what's next? Adam writes, how do you become certified at Rotten Tomatoes and do they pay you when you review movies on their site? Um, I don't know about the certification process for Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Perry, are you certified on Rotten Tomatoes? I am. Tomato? Okay. I, am. Um, I get all the Rotten Tomatoes yeah. money. No, you get nothing. I don't get paid anything. But... Um, I had a somewhat different experience. I've been on Rotten Tomatoes for many years. Mm -hmm. When I started out in this industry, I was a freelancer. And part of the way Rotten Tomatoes works is that when you work for a tomato meter approved outlet, 
you you get an account automatically the the company sets it up for you and your reviews automatically get factored in as a freelancer i had to pursue my own account and at the time I did that, the process was I had to email a certain email account saying I was interested and in listing, you know, all of my outlets, how long I've been working, if I was in any um, any critics organizations, and eventually I was approved and I got an account. And on my account, it listed all of my outlets. But something important to note that just because you have a Rotten Tomatoes account as a critic does not necessarily mean your score gets factored into the tomato meter. Certain outlets I worked for were not very big. And and that, that means if I posted a review under that outlet, it would go on my page, but it would not be factored into the tomato meter and it would not be on the critics page, which is what everyone looks at when they go on a certain movie's page. Then again, if I posted a review for one of my outlets that was, then you would see it there. So there's a lot of different things here, but in terms of specific criteria, I know there's a thing where you have to have posted X amount of reviews within a certain uh, given amount of time just to make sure that, you know, you don't spit out 100 reviews and then stop writing as soon as you're approved. So that's that's kind of the breakdown uh, of how it works. I have a love hate relationship with Rotten Tomatoes. At this, uh, on the one hand, I think it's one of the greatest resources ever. It's so cool that we have this one place where everyone's opinion exists and you can get a really quick rundown of what everybody thinks. Then again, I mean, you guys all know how I feel about putting a number to mm -hmm. something. Something. So the fact that you either get a fresh or a rotten and you get that big fat number and people just dismiss movies based on that kind of hurts it all at the same time. Yeah, I personally am not a approved critic on Rotten Tomatoes. I know I think Mark and uh, Christian are for mm -hmm. schmoes. My take on it is this one they don't get paid for it because people still don't understand what Rotten Tomatoes is. Rotten Tomatoes does not review anything. It's an aggregator site. All they do is pull together the, the, the reviews from other people that are they trust and are approved, and they formulate, it's like an algorithm. They right. formulate a score out based on that. That's why people, it's so ridiculous when people are like, oh, they paid off Rotten Tomatoes. There's nobody to pay off. It's, a, it's an aggregate. It's a, the score comes from all these different people. They would have to pay off everyone in order to get that score, get that fresh rating. So that's the one thing that bothers me with when people don't understand what Rotten Tomatoes is. They're not, there's no Rotten Tomato reviewers. Like they don't work for the company. Well, Gray, doesn't Gray review for Yeah, but that's Rotten? one person. Yeah, yeah, they you have... know what I'm saying? The score that ultimately you get, it's not a Rotten Tomato. Like Gray doesn't determine what that score yeah, is. Of it's, it, it's a culmination right. of everything else. And we looked up, um, was it on Mailbag? We looked up like how many reviews and it's like over 200. Yeah. And they just put them all together and mm -hmm. get the average. Yeah, so. It's also important to note that a C, let's, uh, not, not necessarily a C, but let's say a C plus. For one outlet, that could be fresh. For another, that could be rotten. And then there's also the issue of, let's say, let's say you go on a page for a movie that's like, you know, mediocre, oh, like barely passable. Let's say every single person that reviewed that movie gave, gave it a 5.5 out of 10 yeah. or a 6 out, all of a sudden that movie's fresh. So if right. you go there and you're like, oh, look at yeah. that fresh rating, I have to see that. Maybe those reviews aren't as high on the movie as you think they are. Yeah, and then on the opposite end, you have a movie maybe that people absolutely love, but then there's a contingent of people that don't like, so maybe you'll have a lower score. But ultimately, maybe let's say 80% of the critics gave it an A, like a 10 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10. You're not getting that, that kind of... Uh, response yeah U ultimately though i want to say don't brush off i know people have a lot of negative things to say about rotten tomatoes sometimes but don't brush it off as a tool overall it's a gr i think it's the greatest thing and i just think that when people go on that site don't necessarily just look at the number and then click out of your browser and yes. go I mean, drop money to see a movie do it do a little digging because there's a lot of really talented critics on there who have a lot to say and there's much more to it than a simple number yeah and understand what it is it is an ag aggregator not a score coming from one person all right what's next gary writes hey glider gang now that comic book movies are taken seriously anything can happen what are your dream director creative team property collaborations that you would like to see for me i would love to see george miller direct ghostwriter for marvel joss whedon on x-men ridley scott on green lantern with darius wolski as dp takashi how is that mike meek mike mm, 
on Wolverine or how about Scorsese directing The Punisher with a William Monaghan screenplay and DP duties by Roger Deakins. I know it's not likely, but I can dream, can I? What are your thoughts? You're totally going to find that in a Collider News script next week. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm, pur- I'm purposely just going to randomly plant it there. <laughs> um, for me, uh, one of the comic book movies that I was really excited to see was when Darren Aronofsky was going to do The Wolverine. And then he fell out, and then James Mangold took over. Also, Aronofsky was supposed to do Batman before Chris Nolan as well. Uh, so I wouldn't mind something like what he was talking about. Instead of Scorsese directing Punisher, having Aronofsky do a uh, movie with, with John Bernthal from the Netflix series, with maybe Roger Deakins uh, DPing. Also, um, maybe uh, uh, the comic book saga, Matthew Vaughn directing uh, something like that with Emmanuel Lebeski DPing it. Uh, that's just my suggestion. What about you? I like those options. Um, I Even though I did like Ant-Man, I'm still pretty hung up on Edgar Wright not having directed it. So I wouldn't mind seeing him direct something. And what randomly came to mind, probably because of the Ant-Man connection, is I just love the interaction between Ant-Man and Falcon. Like, if the two of them just went off on a little, like, buddy comedy together, I'd get a pretty big kick out of that. Um, I'm not going to pronounce his name right. Jordan Vote Roberts. He's the director of The Kings of Summer, which I absolutely love. And one of my favorite parts of X-Men Apocalypse was the beginning stuff, the kind of the bringing the group together, the new mutants together, and showing the stuff at the school. I think if we focus just on almost like an X-Men coming-of-age type story, he could be a great director for something like that. Uh, I, I was thinking of Rorschach because I brought him up on... A mailbag a week ago or two weeks ago and a solo movie of his directed by Jeremy Saulnier who did Green Room and Blue Ruin could be really interested interesting given you know the darker nature and that the mentality of that character I think he'd be perfect to explore that I'm also very high right now on uh, Miguel uh, Sapochnik who did a bunch of the oh, episodes yeah. on Game of Thrones he did the last two. I don't care what he directs <laughs> I want to see him direct everything Yes, he directed the last two episodes of Game of Thrones this past season. They were both fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? All right, Anton writes, Hello, Clyder. Back in January of 2015, the old AMC days, I asked you guys what your thoughts were on crowdfunded movies and if you liked the idea behind it. I don't actually think that's supposed to be idea. I think he's got I-D-E-E, and that's an actual word. And I've, I've looked this word up before, but... Whatever. Anyways, let's keep going. It is an actual word. I'm going to change it to idea for this. Now, one and a half years later, with all the new people added to the crew, I would like to hear your thoughts on the subject or if your opinion has changed at all the last year. Also, do you think crowdfunding as a way of financing your movie is going to be a bigger thing in the future, future or will it become a thing of the past? Thanks. I think it will be a bigger thing in the future for indie films. Uh, getting those movies made, small budgets, you know, even something that we saw Veronica Mars end up raising about $5.7 million. They were able to get that off the ground. Not exactly an indie, but still. In terms of big budget films or anything, no way. No way. Because it, it, the question is ownership. Ownership of rights. And studios are not going to give away any ownership. Right now, with crowdfunding, there is no ownership. But however, eventually, imagine if people were starting to actually fund huge movies and those movies did really well. Everyone would be like, wait a moment. I donated X amount of money, almost like a stockholder. They're like, well, I shouldn't, I get a return because I was one of the initial investors. So I just don't see it as a possibility at all for anything big. Yeah. I don't think that would ever happen. The way I divide it up is looking at crowdfunding for people who not necessarily are big names, who are somewhat well-known, for example, like a Rob Zombie who crowdfunded 31. I don't foresee it going away for those kinds of people. Another example is Hardcore Henry. I, I believe the way it worked for that one is they shot a lot of it and then they did a crowdfunding campaign after to help with posts. So I think it's alive and thriving right now for scenarios like that where people can tap into fan bases and make movies that bigger studios won't necessarily back like these two movies but personally on I I guess just on a personal level having crowdfunded a couple of movies in film school I will never ever touch it again because I'll tell you there is nothing more I don't know if degrading is the right word I just don't feel comfortable asking people for money and 
in the situation I was in in school, you know, you're paying for your tuition, mm -hmm. and you have to, even though the, the films are requirements, you are funding your own short films as well, and they cost a lot of money. And like, yeah, you can make a little teeny five-minute short and think, oh, that's not a big deal, but when you factor in, you know, equipment, feeding people, potentially housing people, it's a lot of money. So I've been in quite a few situations in school where I had no choice but to use Kickstarter. And the first time, it was very exciting. Mm. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. It was like free money. Look at all this. And by the end, I mean, just sending out another email blast to mm. friends and family. I'm like, oh, am I really going through this again? And then it hits that point where you come to realize that there's a good chance you're not making every penny that you need and on Kickstarter for example if you don't hit your goal you lose everything you've just raised so it's this terrible mentality of having to pick a goal number that you know meets your needs but also is a number where if you don't necessarily make everything that you need you can then fill it yourself so it's this really right. manipulative horrifying situation and I just don't ever want the pressure to have to crowdfund anything of my own ever again Nothing in life is free, Perry. Clearly. Yes. You're not going to get free money. Um, I'm interested in using Kickstarter or any crowdfunding for my own personal projects. But yeah, it, it, it's more of a trying to find that balance of what's an actual achievable goal versus, you know, what can you actually, can you actually use that amount of money to create something? You're not going to get millions of dollars, but maybe you can get tens of thousands of dollars. All right, what's next? Patrick writes, we all know of the disappointing disaster that was M. Night Shyamalan's adaptation of The Last Airbender. Still waiting on that Collider commentary. Although I have absolutely forgiven Knight, I'm still hoping that we can get a proper live action retelling of the hit animated show, possibly bringing in a new audience. But knowing that the story of The Last Airbender is way too big for a movie saga, what if they make a Netflix live action series? I thought of it while watching the show yesterday and even wrote a fan screenplay for an episode. My question is, do you think a live action miniseries adaptation of the show will work? Do you think the fan base will be on board? Uh, I'm really looking forward to doing the last airbender uh, commentary. That's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of things to be said about that movie. I love the animated series. I don't think they can do a live action one just because the money and budget involved. You need a movie style budget to do it well. Two, you already have that the animated series as a television series for people to watch, so there's not necessarily a reason to have a live action version. They just have the animated one. So I, I don't know. I mean, of course the fan base would be on board. They probably want more stuff and they want to maybe wipe the bad taste out of their mouth of the movie. Uh, Perry, what do you think? I know absolutely nothing about the source material, okay. so I can't really comment too Did much Did you watch on the movie? This. I, I did, which is a little upsetting because like I've heard from you and I've yeah. heard from another a number of people that the animated series is fantastic. Is. My first experience with The Last Air Airbender was, and I was a big M. Night Shyamalan fan mm -hmm. at the time. I was defending him to no end. I was so hyped what, what, for what Last. What were you defending him about? <sighs> Lady in the Water, yeah. The well, Happening. You know, well, all right, Lady in the Water and The Happening, not so much, but I do give him some credit for The Village. I like I that not, movie more that so movie. than most people do, and Signs was one of those movies that I've I've watched and rewatched, God knows how many times, but I was holding out hope that The Last Airbender was gonna be okay. It was also one of my first really big junkets in New mm -hmm. York, so I was really hyped for that, and then, you know, you go and see the movie, and you're like, oh, I gotta talk about that all day tomorrow, <laughs> and like keep a straight face in front of the cast and the filmmaker, oh, that's awful, but based on the hype around the material, I would kind of want to see a live action TV show just because I wanna see what the potential of the the material is, but I don't know if it would ever happen at this point. Did you watch The Visit, M. Night Shyamalan's? I did. I, was liked, it good? I like The Visit. I hadn't seen it. I like The Visit quite a bit. Okay. It's a it's a really like nice kind of short little creepy mm. thriller with some really uh, unique weird twists to it. And the two kids in that movie, it's a found footage style movie. And I, I for one, think found footage movies ride or die on very believable performance very believable performances and the two lead kids in that are so so good yeah do you think m night has has his groove back i mean he you know for, for six cents and unbreakable you know he, there's obviously talent there um do you I think i don't know if i would say he has his groove back i do think if he continues to come up with really 
original ideas mm -hmm. rather than falling back on the fact that we know him for creating that crazy twist maybe yes. i mean the visit is just so different compared to everything else he had directed so far if he keeps making very different things i think i i hope people will start making a disconnect between what he was known for in the past and what he can do in the future. That'd be like the greatest comeback story in I'd, film. I'd like to see it. Uh, Sinead, uh, you said uh, your your brother watched this series? Mm -hmm. It was Nickelodeon, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, he watched it. He was really obsessed with it. So I, I've seen a lot of it mm -hmm. just from when we were living together. And I will say what I did see of the animated show, I really liked, which I never expected to like something of, of this genre. And I also felt like I was like a teenager mm -hmm. at that point. So I was like, Ugh. but I actually, <laughs> Cartoons. right. Like, ew. but I actually really, really liked this show. Um, I don't think that we could get a live action TV show because I just don't think they could pull off everything that the show does live action wise on TV. I just don't think that anyone ha would have the budget mm. to do that. Um, and in terms of making it into an animated show again, I mean, that ran 2005 to 2008. Like that's not that long ago. No. So I just, I don't, right now I don't see a super big need for it. And if it was going to be live action, I, I, I would like to see that. That'd be so cool. But in terms of putting it on Netflix, I, I just don't think they could come up with a way to really give the show what it deserves on like a budget like Netflix. Did you watch the, the movie at all? I did not. Okay, you should keep it that way. You, No, no, you should check it out because <laughs> you'll be in for for something. Really? You'll be like, That's funny. what is this? You'll never forgive Dennis. Yeah. Really quick, did you say you enjoyed The Lady in the Water? No, oh, no. Okay. That That is one that... Crossed off my awful. M Night Shyamalan it's list. I will never Literally watch that ever again. Ever yeah. yeah, and one of the scenes you see like the microphone bobbing on the side. I remember. Oh, oh really? I yeah, mean, it's really bad. It, for me, that scene in the in the shower was just terrible. When she's like, they're trying to figure out this stuff. I was like, for me, it's the entire plot. Yeah, connecting the dots in every respect is just awful. I actually yeah. saw that movie in the movie theater, and oh, it's did you? just like I was like, what the hell am I watching? This yeah. is terrible. <laughs> All right, let's do the last question. All right. Cody Miller writes, I've been a hardcore fan of everyone and everything you guys do since the AMC days. I'm a professional swimmer for Team USA, and last night I qualified for my first Olympics, making my lifelong dream come true. Attached is a photo after the race. I've been thinking about and preparing for this moment my entire life. Collider Movie Talk, Mailbag Heroes, and Jedi, Jedi Council has been part of my daily routine since the show's origin. I want to thank every single one of you for providing movie fans and sweat with such incredible content. Your work has provided unmeasurable stress relief for me on my journey to the Olympics. The thousands of hours of training I've put in has been incredibly hard. However, Collider content has been a way for me to decompress daily. When I was dead tired and stressed, Collider helped me relax by focusing on one of my greatest passions, movies. My question is a two-parter. Number one, what is your favorite motivational, inspirational film? Some of mine are Warrior, Rush, and Forrest Gump. Number two, what do you, each of you guys do in your personal lives to decompress, relax, and clear your heads. For me, I watch Movie Talk and all Collider content. It never fails to calm my nerves and entertain me. Thank you for taking my question and helping me achieve my dream. All right, first let's uh, bring up the picture of Cody Miller uh, that he sent in there. He is qualifying for the Olympics. Congratulations. Awesome. Love it. That's really cool, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, sending that in. Uh, in. As far as inspirational m movies, um, it's, it's weird for me saying people don't People don't know a lot about this movie. It's a documentary called American Movie. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. Okay, so it's it's about it's about this aspiring filmmaker oh in God, Wisconsin I think I have seen this. named uh, Mark Burchard, yes, and he's I've trying to that. make a short movie called uh, Coven. And he's not particularly talented. <gasps> this movie, I've seen it. This documentary, it broke my heart. <laughs> it broke my heart. This is inspirational to you. Yes, it, it's inspirational to me because. <laughs> He, all he wants to do is make movies. He's not talented. Uh, he has no connections. He's in the middle of nowhere. He has no money. But he is so persistent. Mm -hmm. He is so driven to make his short film, which he, he like he wants to make his short film so then he can make his his like feature film. So he's like going around asking everybody to, for help. He like convinces his uncle to give him money. He's got. He's got this his friend helping him out who's like totally like 
drugged out of his mind. Like, it, <laughs> this is making me so sad all over again. But it's it's inspired to me because it's like, okay, here's a guy who has that drive to do something. Um, there's a great speech in it about because he works at um, a, a, a was it a funeral home or like a cemetery and just like about how he has to clean up the toilets. It, it's, it's, it's you just, should actually have the box quote and it yeah. should be the most inspirational yeah, movie ever. But I mean, he takes like when he went to that goes to edit cause he's shooting on 16, he goes to edit and he brings his kids, which, you know, he's not married, but he has kids and he brings them to the editing room, like the flatbed editing room, not like, you know, and he has them sleep on the floor oh. as he's editing. I I don't know. There's something about that movie I find very, very, very charming. I'm going to have to watch that yes. now. Um, oh before I give my answer, I just want to congratulate Cody, too, because, I mean, I think I speak for all of us, where we were a little stalkerish, and we Googled you, and like I read some things about your story, and it's just like an incredible achievement. So congratulations. We're all rooting for you. My inspirational movies, as a kid, I'd have to say The Sandlot and Mighty Ducks just because I was big into sports and I look at that and I'm like, oh, I want to be like, you know, those characters and all that kind of stuff. Recently, I'd probably go for Eddie the Eagle, too, because that, one's good. that was just like, oh, my God, I walked out of that movie like floating on a cloud. I felt wonderful and like I could do anything. But most recently, the biggest one is actually the movie Brooklyn because... Mm. First, I saw Brooklyn, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, if you don't know what Brooklyn is, is it's the, the one that was nominated for an Academy Award for Saoirse Ronan's performance. It's about an Irish immigrant who comes to Brooklyn, and she's got to make a life for herself. She leaves her family behind. And it came out in theaters right about the time where I was making the decision to come here. Mm. So having, and one of the big issues I had with coming out to LA was I wanted to do the work here, but I was so, so scared to leave my family. And watching what she goes through in that movie, it's like, you know, like I could, I could do it. And some terrible things happen to her in that movie, but it's, it's all about her journey and her holding herself together and kind of her figuring out what the most important thing in her life is and what kind of path she wants to take. So I just found that super, super inspiring. Sinead? Um, yeah, a little stalkerish. This I was like on my Instagram like mm -hmm, for like a half hour. Um, first of all, congratulations. That's so awesome. You're super cute. I've checked out every social media you have. Feel free to hit me up. I was thinking about following you, but then I thought that was a little too creepy. But now that we've kind of met over the camera, I'm going to go ahead and follow you. You can just follow me back. Don't don't feel the pressure or anything. But, you know, show up in my DMs. Not a big deal. Um, all right, you guys. Inspirational movies. Um, I'm not kidding. Inspirational movies. I have The Social Network. Um, for me, when I think of inspirational movies, I, I was like, at a time when I was deciding what the hell I was gonna do, I still lived with my parents, I was like 19, I went, tried school, I didn't like it, I knew I wanted to act or do something, but I, I just, I didn't feel like I could. I come from a, a city where you grow up in the city, you stay there your whole life, you teach at the high school you went to, you know everybody around you for forever, and I just didn't feel like, leaving was safe and then I saw the social network and I was like okay these kids are in school and you know they're smart and he has an idea and like the whole movie to me was just spoke volumes of like what you can achieve if you put the right thoughts and processes behind it and then I also have um the pursuit of happiness um obviously the entire movie is just perseverance mm -hmm. and then I have Dead Poet Society which I love and I think there are so many great quotes but there's one in particular no matter what anybody tells you words and ideas can change the world um, and I think that that for me kind of goes through all three movies and kind of like where I am at in my life it's like I'm still young every time I find myself in a new job I'm usually the youngest person you are pretty young I'm pretty young, you guys. I'm like about to turn 15. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I am pretty young. So like I'm in my mid-20s now and kind of like heading towards 
like adulthood, if you will. And I always find myself on the younger side in in every job that I'm in. And it's like, you're, I'm always told what to do. And I, I come from a world of scripted where you literally are always told what to do. And I like the idea of being able to stop and remember that even though I'm only 24, like I can think for myself and that my ideas and my words do matter. And there is like a space for everyone's ideas and thoughts. Nice. That speech was yeah. really motivating. Thank you. I like Thank that. Uh, I want to list a few other movies. That it's a Wonderful Life and Rocky and uh, uh, there's a few other ones. Uh, oh, Miracle, the, the one about the U.S. Uh, hockey team in the 80s. Uh, what other stuff? Uh, the second part of his question was about uh, decompress. We our own life. Well, yeah, to decompress. Uh, Perry? I love this question because it just feels like we live in this bubble here and most of the time I actually do decompress by watching movies. So I like having to think of what I do outside of that and probably obvious, but one of the things I do to decompress is I spend time with my family. No matter what's going on at work, I always know if I hang out with my family, I'm gonna feel better. I also have a cat that I'm mildly obsessed with and there's nothing that makes me feel better than going home from a long day of work and sitting on the couch and watching a movie with him. And then I'm also super into sports, so I do a lot of running. I've been dabbling in CrossFit here, which apparently is the most L.A. thing I could be doing since I've moved here. But or yoga. Yeah, yoga's too boring for me. I need, like, serious activity. But the running is definitely my favorite thing. There's nothing that really makes me happier than just tuning out for an hour and kind of just running straight with some music on. So I'd probably go with those things. Sinead? Um, well, yeah, I grew up in sports. I played soccer for eight years, and um, I actually ran Junior Olympics for cross country. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened, Fun you guys. Fact. I didn't. I don't know what happened. I'm not very athletic anymore. But um, I do still enjoy like getting up and getting outside. Since soccer and cross country, I spent most of my life outside. And something that helps me to stress out is just like going outside and like looking at the outdoors because we spend most of our time indoors and then like hanging out with my kid and you know my family and eating I know people are like you're stress eating like put the donuts down <laughs> but I think there is something about food and it doesn't have to be unhealthy food that can make you feel good or comfort you and kind of take the edge off a little bit. I'm going to bet that she just stole your answer. Am yeah, I right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess actually both of you did. <laughs> so for me, and it, it's sad as it sounds because all our work is revolves around movies and television, but I literally, when I go home, if, I, if I'm too tired, I'll just watch movies or mm -hmm. TV and it helps me relax. Um, but also going out to eat, eating good food is definitely up there because that's that one you actually have to leave your house right. to do, and you get you different environments. It's it's one of those things that I'm willing to spend money on uh, because, you know, food is not especially good food is not cheap, mm -hmm. especially here in L. A. In L. A. So when you go out and sit down, it's like okay, but to me it's worth it. It's one of those things I just don't skimp on anymore. I don't. Like back in college, like you could eat your like top ramen for 10 cents a thing or whatever. I used to eat like tuna, just tuna and rice. But it's like now I'm like older. I'm like, I don't want to live like a college student anymore. It was like so Asian of yeah. you. I love it. <laughs> so I, I just feel like, hey, I'm older now. I deserve better. I feel like I've been eating well here right off the bat because you have showed me the town and made sure I'm eating at all the right spots. Even though I eat at the same places over and over, I can always count on you to give me good recommendations. Yes, and then you can go to at least more places than just... Kabuki. Were you at least eating tuna rice like pokey? Because I can eat <laughs> no, that shit every no. single no, day. No, it, it was when I was working out. And so every time after I worked out, I came back and I would just make rice and I would take tuna from a can. Oh, no. And just put it on there. This is like the yeah. saddest image. But I mean, back then, yeah, I had no money and I right. would spend money on alcohol. Like, that, that's basically where all my money went was to alcohol. And so I had to, you know, trim down my food budget. But right. now, it's, it's weird to say, post-college, like... Alcohol budget goes down, my food budget goes way mm -hmm, up. Mm -hmm. 
All right, guys. Uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us on this episode of Collider Mailbag. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I want to thank the people joining us at the table today. Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at that's Sinead.com. On Mondays, I'm here hosting Collider TV Talk. On Fridays, hosting Movie Talk. And over the weekend, hosting Mailbag. And Perry? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. I am on Collider Nightmares every Tuesday, best of the week every Saturday. And have a good holiday weekend, everyone. And thanks to Cody and Adam in the back over there. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. I'm on Movie Talk Mondays and Fridays, Mailbags on Saturdays, and then the occasional spoiler review or television review or whatever random stuff that we do here. Make sure to subscribe, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.